Welcome to the Hospital Finance Podcast, your go-to source for information and insights that can help you stay ahead of the challenges impacting healthcare finance. And now, the host of the Hospital Finance Podcast, Michael Passanate. Hi, this is Mike Passanate, and welcome back to the Hospital Finance Podcast. I'm coming to you live today from the Revenue Cycle Leaders Forum in Frisco, Texas, and we've just uh, wrapped up a few very uh, productive days here at the forum, and I'm joined by two Revenue Cycle uh, leaders who participated in the forum, and we have some, I think, pretty interesting areas to cover and and go over. So first, on my left is Ryan O'Hara, who's the Chief Revenue Officer at Northern Arizona Healthcare in Flagstaff, Arizona, and on my right is Scott Williams, Associate Vice President, PRMO at Duke University Health in Durham, North Carolina. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you. you. So um, over the last couple of days, as I mentioned, we've, we've covered a lot of ground, um, and I thought we'd focus in on a few areas that really affect the patient experience in the revenue cycle, because that seemed like a, a major focus of, of what we covered here. So first off, um, patient frustrations, I think, were, were sort of uh, an area that, that came up. Um, things like uh, determining eligibility early on, determining financial responsibility, uh, patients getting several bills maybe from different providers that were all a part of, of their care experience at the hospital. And so um, I'm interested to hear from, from both of you um, what you've done maybe in your institutions to tackle uh, some of those issues or uh, where you think there's areas for improvement in, in what you're striving to achieve. So who wants to kick us off? So I, I, this is Scott. Scott. I, I would say a, a couple of things in particular that we've all collectively tried to focus on, not just at Duke University, but certainly the entire industry. One is doing a better job at patient estimates, you know, trying to provide a picture ahead of time to the patient of what their responsibility is going to be and providing some greater clarity on that from an education perspective. And then that drives to a certain extent our ability to collect on those balances also. But it's really more about patient education and satisfaction. So trying to do that estimate, easier said than done in, in, a, in a very complex healthcare environment, easier to do, for example, in a dentist's office because there's fewer services involved than, than in typical uh, larger healthcare organization. So certainly part of it is patient estimates. The other part I would say that most of us are trying to focus on is just making the interaction of the patient with the revenue cycle easier. And typically for most of us, that's trying to do things more online rather than person to person or phone call to phone call. Um, a 24 seven experience where patients can go online to see their bill, pay a bill, schedule appointment, look at their medical records, set up a payment plan, see their, their clinical outcomes. Um, so the more we can do of that, the, the easier it is. Certainly not every patient is going to engage on those opportunities, but a fair number of them are, and, and it's all contributing towards how to complement the clinical experience. And we talked about some of the difficulties around that, I think, even just scheduling, which seems pretty innocuous, right? I'm going to, you know, we're going to have a schedule up, you pick your time, but it's not because I think the example someone gave was, what about the doc that, you know, the orthopod that wants to see a left-handed patients on Tuesdays, right? And how do you, how do you get that knowledge in, into that, into that scheduler? Yeah. And, and, and that, you're right, it, it is taking very complex organizations and trying to simplify them to a certain extent so that they make more sense for the workflows and the patient expectations because the patient doesn't really much care about how we're organized internally. They're coming to each of us as healthcare providers to address a healthcare need and, and, and how do we put ourselves uh, into it from their perspective. And Ryan, you've talked about the patient as the customer this week and not, not necessarily thinking about them as the patient or the beneficiary, but what, is that, what does that mean for Northern Arizona Healthcare? Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I think I've, I've really kind of changed. I, I mentioned this in the meeting of I don't really think of healthcare almost as an industry anymore. I, 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 I've, in my own mind, at least segmented it into the service industry. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and kind of to Scott's point, um, we, we've typically built our construct around a customer experience that could, the tagline could be something like this. Come get care. Come get high cost care on our terms. Yeah, right? so that's kind of the way it's always been. And I think Scott brings up some really good points. Of we've got to start saying, how do we get you the right care at the right place at the right time? And how do we do it on your terms instead of always on our terms? Um, I mean, there's always the analogy of the waiting room, right? It, the the name itself implies inefficiency, <laughs> right? It's a room where you're going to go sit and wait for us to do the way things the way we want to do them 
until we're ready for you. Mm -hmm. um, and great service, great service companies don't think that way. They think, how do we create a value? How do we create a value proposition? And I think that's what it really goes back to is, how do we create a value proposition around the delivery of healthcare so that customers choose to opt in to spend their money on that? Um, as opposed to other things. And so, I mean, we're certainly trying to do a lot of the same things um, Scott is doing in terms of just trying to say the way you are going to access healthcare is not going to be on our terms anymore. It's going to be on your terms or at least mutual terms, right? You still have insurance at the middle of it. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got to get the authorization work done and that kind of thing, which is really a, a, a service delivery to the, to the consumer as well because um, we don't want them to bear unnecessary responsibility, nor do we want to take unnecessary loss of revenue for delivering care that hasn't been authorized because whether we like it or not, insurance is, is at the middle of, of, mm -hmm. of a lot of this stuff. So uh, let, me, let me just ask you a follow-up question to that. I mean, certainly healthcare is complex, and all of us here and all of our listeners know that, but other industries are complex too. I mean, if I, if I can get online and get uh, look at my airline you know, seats for today and change my seat and maybe even change my flight on an app. Um, what's holding healthcare up? I think part of it is the, is the complexity. <clears throat> You're right. There are plenty of other industries that are complex, but how we choose to deliver services and delineate them um, create some of that complexity. You know, you know, right now there's a fair amount of legislature at the federal and, and state level to have providers list their, their charge masters online. That transparency makes a lot of sense at, at the first level of review. It, it does, I think, to all of us in the industry. When you dig down and deeper, you realize the complexity. And for Duke University, for example, our charge master is 125,000 items. Um, that are unfortunately fair or not are not listed very coherently. Um, you know, th things that patients say, well, I want to know how much it is to get a knee replacement right. or deliver a baby or get an MRI. You know, 125,000 versions of that make it so much more complex. Even as something as simple as, you know, so I twisted my knee, I need to get an MRI, well, with or without contrast. Mm -hmm. You know, we in the industry know what that means. The average patient is like, I. I have no idea right. what that means there. And so um, information overload okay. is part of the challenge. And I think, part again, part of the, the onus is back on us as an industry. How do we simplify those charge masters? How do we make them more straightforward, simple? How do we provide education to our patients, our customers, because they don't want it delivered in that fashion? Yeah. And so our challenge is how to get from here to there. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think the easy... There, there's absolutely some truth to it, but there's a bit of a cop out to it as well. Um, is is that insurance is at the center of all this stuff, and that's and that's true. But I think one of the biggest things in terms of the complexity, and when you talk about your charge master, I can talk about my charge master, is that I don't know of another industry where charges don't mean anything. Right? right? It's not, it, our charges really don't. They're 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 the, the negotiating point with insurance. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you go and buy groceries, you go and get your oil changed, the charge is the charge. Right. You know what you're paying. Here, our charges are not charges, and it's, and it's just the constructs kind of polluted that way, and I think it adds complexity to it. Again, insurance is at the center of a lot of that and why we do it, but they're not the only ones to blame. I mean, we've got our own, we've got our own housekeeping that we've got to take care of too, but I think that's probably the biggest complexity that it, people just can't understand is that a charge isn't a charge. It is a great point, and truth be told, the average patient doesn't really care what the charge is. What they care about is what their portion of responsibility mm -hmm. is going to be. It could be a million dollar charge, but if I owe twenty dollars in that, what I care is about the twenty dollars, right. not the million dollars. So how do we translate that? And you're right, the complexity that Ryan's describing, because we all have different contracts with our different payers, and are typically, you know, what's what the money really getting exchanged exchange between payers and patients and providers is a tiny fraction of those very inflated list prices that tend to play out in the media. So let's let's talk about payers in a little bit more depth. I mean, I, there's probably some revenue cycle um, wish lists around that <laughs> that we talked about. Um, you know, but, but what's the reality there? I mean, we've got uh, hospitals that are contracted with, you know, maybe a couple of dozen could be you know health plans at, at a time depending on your, your area or what, what's going on and, and in, inside of that there's all kinds of different contract terms and, and things that you have to comply with um, what would the world look like if we, we had you know fewer payers or maybe even a single payer uh, would that conceivably help make the revenue cycle better a better patient experience for in in a sense for the through the revenue cycle um, or is it more of a matter of trying to standardize the constructs of, of what what 
insurance would cover um, and, and how it would cover it and how it would pay for it. So it's, it's simpler um, as, you, as you move from plan to plan. So it's certainly in our industry over the last 10 plus years, some consolidation has been occurring on the payer side in the same way that's been happening on the provider side, right? I mean, provide large providers are, and the large health systems are buying up smaller community hospitals and private physician practices. So there's consolidation on the provider side, consolidation on the payer side, and each one of those trends are changing kind of the balance of power between providers and payers sometimes in a good way and sometimes not necessarily in a good way from a patient perspective, um, which is where we're all trying to, to keep this angle going. The, I, the, the relationship between providers and, payer, uh, and payers, to my, from my perspective, is relatively complex. Right? We're both trying to deliver uh, the, the care or the, 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 uh, the need, health care needs that the patient uh, needs. Um, but doing it in different ways. And we're both trying to control that relationship with the patient. I mean, that really is what's going on in the industry right now is providers want to maintain their relationship with the patient. Payers want to maintain their relationship with their members. Um, and, and we're not complete at, at crosshairs in terms of what's going on, but, but it is a competitive relationship there. I mean, there's a reason why providers call them third-party payers. We think we're the, you know, the main relationship sure. with the patient, and it's those third parties that are getting in the way. Mm -hmm. And um, the reality is we both add value, but it, but it is a competitive relationship. And, and you know, certainly payers gradually are getting, you know, we, we see in our marketplace payers are adding providers to their organization mm -hmm. and, and growing horizontally as well as vertically, um, which is a different competitive environment. And certainly some of the large provider organizations are becoming self-insured and getting into insurance products. So there's some blending of the relationship there, but, but that is the dynamic that's playing out. Is the, is the consolidation of, of payers and fewer payers, is that a benefit to the patients, do you think? Or do you think, um, when you think back and you had a greater variety of payers, was that a more competitive environment, a more um, uh, an environment where, where, where it cost less maybe or had, added more choice? Did that, did that add something to the patient experience? I, I, I think it, it does a little on both sides, right? Fewer payers um, from a provider perspective think, make things more administratively simplistic. Not you know, dealing with 100 different payers and their rules rather than 400 different payers and their rules is certainly better. If you take it all the way down to a single payer system, there are some other you know, factors that, that play into that. Uh, so I don't know that a single payer is, is necessarily the solution to administrative simplification. You know, in our industry, you know, certainly electronic transactions defined by ANSI standards with claims and payments and authorizations, eligibility, that's add a certain standardization that in theory all payers and providers follow regardless of how many payers and providers there are. That's added to some degree, but there's also the perspective of fewer, fewer number of players in the industry, whether payers or providers, I mean there's, there's less competition. Mm -hmm. And the less competition there is, there's, you know, that generally probably is not a good thing for customers and patients. So I think there's a healthy balance of having few but not one mm -hmm. uh, in the industry that would be good for patients. What's your take on it, Ryan? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I kind of made a, a wild statement here at the forum yesterday of I, I would prefer zero payers. Um, now, I don't think that can happen, um, nor will it, uh, almost from a, from a reason that, for the same reason the automobile industry wasn't allowed to, to, to fall on itself. Um, if, if healthcare represents 20% of our GDP, which it does, then you've got to reckon that insurance represents a statistically relevant part of that 20% as well, and can you let that, that percentage of the GDP collapse? No, you can't. But here's what, it, here's what a zero-payer system conceptually would do, is, is it would get rid of those fake charges that we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. right? It would now allow me to deal with you just on a, on a, on a cost margin basis. Um, and I'm, I'm now responsible for delivering a, a service to you. Um, and I decided that my profit margin that I go after is X, let's call it 5% for this um, thing, and, 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 and then I just start working with you. I mean, you can still do the same kind of HSA-related stuff mm -hmm. that employers, most, most insurances employer provided, you can still have them even participate and, and bear some of that cost. It could be shared the way most of them are too, and say, I'm putting 
instead of $400 towards your, your health premium, I'm putting $400 into a health savings account. Right. And that is there for you when you need to access health care, when you choose to access health care. Um, again, I think it would lower the water level by, and you think about the industry, billions. Um, and then when you lower the water level by billions, you could then start making health care more affordable, potentially. But that's all pie in the sky, and it's not going to happen, I don't think. So insurance still is, the, still is at the center of, of, of what we're doing. Um, but I, I, I think Scott makes a good point. And when we were whiteboarding things out yesterday, that was one of the things is, is insurance thinks of, of, of what I call customers as their beneficiary. Providers think about customers as their patient. Revenue cycle peers might think about them as a guarantor, but why can't we just interchange all that with customer, 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 and, and create a shared value? And I think that's where we're all just kind of off with insurance is we have not created any sort of shared value proposition. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's about them, um, and I don't mean them in an adversarial way, but it's an adversarial relationship. Um, it, it's, it's about them trying to um, oftentimes not pay out what they should because of rules that are created by both them and CMS that we have to adapt to. Um, but wouldn't it be great if we just somehow got to that shared trust to say, listen, I don't even care what your operating margin is as an insurance company. It's going, going to be way, way, way better than mine. Mm -hmm. And that's okay if that, because that's, that's what we chose to do. But to say, what's the shared value to just take the noise out of this and lower the water level for everybody? Because I think by actually lowering the water level, Insurances could still make better operating margins than they're doing, but it's a game that we've all decided to participate in, which is we're going to just line item deny you and create an amount mm -hmm. of work because we create the rules that you then have to adapt to, and we hope you don't adapt to them all the time. And that's not what's best for the customer. Mm -hmm. But it, part of it is is we all look at that customer as something different to us, and wouldn't it be great if it was it was shared and we all saw them as our sick mother, our sick child, mm -hmm. you know, our sick friend instead of a guarantor, a beneficiary, whatever, right? Yeah. I think the other big issue, probably for us as a whole, that's driving what, where the industry is going more so than the number of payers or the number of providers and, and where that consolidation, those trends end up there, is what's occurring with payment reform, right? The, the bigger issue is right now in a fee-for-service environment, regardless of how many payers and providers there are, that drives all of us towards certain behavior, some of that productive, some of it less so. You know, as, as the payment methodologies and, and payment reform starts to occur with paying more for quality or value, however that's defined, that's going to change paying, paying for, you know, the, the, the you know, fee for service of paying for quantity to paying for quality. Now, whether it ever ends up with something as pure right or wrong as capitation uh, or, or population health and the rest of it, that's really what's going to drive how, how payers and providers work together to take care of the needs of our customers. That's an unknown and that's a scary part for all of us. Scary but as well as an opportunity and I think you know, the challenge for all of us is how we adapt to the fact that that is coming down the pipeline. And you're adapting to greater out-of-pocket costs for patients, right? So are we seeing a move for insurance? I mean, obviously there's, there's, there's a cost driver there. Is that going to change the, the, the mentality of patients, customers in the marketplace to thinking about insurance almost truly as, as insurance is? It's catastrophic, right? I mean, car insurance is, it's not prepaid, right? <laughs> Repairs, you don't think of it that way. You use right. it if you have to use it. Is health insurance, are we, going to, are we going to start thinking about it that way, or is that, are we still a long way from that? I, I, I would argue it's, it's already started to head in that direction. I mean, when you look at the exchange programs that, you know, through, through health care reform that came out three or four years ago, most of them have, they have huge deductibles, right? $2,500 to $6,000 deductibles. When you have that side of deductible, you don't have health insurance. You have exactly what you described, catastrophic coverage. Now, whether that's the wave of the future or not, certainly payers right now use patient responsibility as a throttle on volume. Um, right or wrong, that's what they're hoping to achieve. Uh, and that works for some patient populations, but not for others. And, and so I think the, the payment methodology of the future are going to have to get beyond that to figure out how do we get patients, customers, to have enough skin in the game um, to, to, to change their behavior. Because part of, part of healthcare in the United States is our customers, our patients taking that on themselves rather than the healthcare industry being responsible for their, entirely responsible for their health. Yeah, I think it's a really, it's, a, it's an astute point and something I've <clears throat> kind of talked about for years is 
why is healthcare insurance different than all other insurance? Because that's what other insurance is. It's meant to keep you from bankruptcy. It's meant to, it's catastrophic by nature. <clears throat> and I certainly agree that that's where healthcare insurance has kind of started to, to go, if not fully there. Um, I mean, no, I don't think anybody can say their benefits were as good as they were 15 years ago, their health benefits, right? They're just, it's just not, that, the, that ship has sailed. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think it gets back, at least personally to me, to that conversation of could it just be a relationship with, with the consumer then at that mm-hmm. point, right? It's, it's, it's some, you have, I have a good or service, in our case it's a service that you want and you're willing to pay X and, and it just becomes more, more transparent. Um, and more realistic because you're not going to send a patient your charge master rate on their bill, right? Because that would be impossible for them to cover. You'd have to go, you'd have to come up with a, a realistic price for unless the service. Unless it was real, right? Right. Unless it, yeah, unless I mean, so for instance, I mean, we're a 1.7 billion gross organization and a 700 million net. That doesn't that doesn't make sense to anybody else in any other industry. Like, right. no, your gross revenue is 1.7 billion. That's great. yeah, but our net because there's just this noise there's just this noise in there. And I think um, I, I again, I just go back to I, it's a it's a it's a good point to, to kind of recognize that at some point in the 70s, 80s or something, healthcare insurance became something that was just supposed to pay for it, everything, mm-hmm. and not something that was supposed to keep you from, from catastrophic financial burden. Yeah, yeah. No, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, there's just one other area I want to touch on briefly before we break, and, and that's uh, telemedicine. And, and obviously that's something that's burgeoning now. They're trying to figure it out, you know, different, different regulations in different states, a lot of different viewpoints on that. I'm just curious, in, in your own geographic areas, have you seen an impact uh, at your facilities? And, and if so, has that dropped to the revenue cycle yet? Yeah, it's, so I, th- I think telemedicine is, at its core, healthcare on your terms the customer, right? It's, it's, do you want to access care this way? We should give you that option. I'll tell, I'll, t- I'll just personally, it is probably an experience that we, I deal with more at Northern Arizona Healthcare than certainly you, you, you probably deal with in, in, in Durham, um, is my, my most vulnerable population and, and the, the, the population that I could service best via telemedicine is my Native American population. Um, if you know anything about Northern Arizona, then the northeast corner of that state is the largest Native American reservation in the, in the country. Um, and we consider that a very important service area to us um, because you, you can't pick and choose, nor would you ever want to, what your service area is. Um, but that's the population that I could best serve via telemedicine, and it's the population we best tried to serve via telemedicine. The problem with that population is reliable connectivity is a, is a huge problem. And so we've got machines um, sitting in, in Tuba City and, and elsewhere um, on, on, on reservation land that sometimes we don't even know where the machines are. And even when we try to use them, they just don't work. Because if you're, I think it's great for, for, for the well-to-do person who says, I don't want to go sit in a clinic. I would rather just pick up my phone and I would have a consult with my doctor, and I'm sure a doctor would love that. They would be able to knock out more visits, not and not from an RVU standpoint. They would be helping more people because mm-hmm. that's why doctors get into it. I'm, I'm, I believe that. Um, the problem for me with telemedicine is that vulnerable population that you could serve, that kind of remote population that you could serve, you run into technology issues of the of, of the technology working and delivering the kind of medicine that you'd actually even want to do just because. Of, mostly connectivity related things yeah but yeah I, well, I, in our experience and every every place across the country has a little bit different experiences certainly in some parts of rural North Carolina we have a little bit of what you described but for in most of the the cases where we are in, in North Carolina we have decent connectivity and and the I look at it and say telemedicine is a great idea, has always been a great idea. The technology to support telemedicine honestly has been in place for 20 plus years. It has not grown to the extent it, it ought to or need to, be, again, because providers and payers, and they both have skin in that game, have not worked well enough together to mm. say, how can we make sure this is appropriate? You know, in, in our environment, too many payers, in fact, very few payers will actually pay for telemedicine, which 
you look at it and you say, well, that's crazy. It's so, it's so much a lower cost of health care. Why, you know, I mean, payers ought to be pushing this on us, saying we demand that you do a certain amount in telemedicine. Instead, we have had have any, any coverage, you know, policies. And I think the payers are worried about utilization going through the roof if you make it, if you make health care access so easy through telemedicine. So there's two sides to that argument there. In our environment, because so few payers are reimbursing it, We've decided to go down the path of saying even if payers aren't going to reimburse it, we're going to do it in cases where we can lower our mm. costs. I mean, follow-up visits for surgeries, for example. Um, the more we can do that by telemedicine, even if we're not going to get paid, the more we can free up spots for other patients that have a greater need for that care besides a, in theory, l relatively lower risk follow-up visit from a surgery and the rest of it. So trying to pick and choose. But it is crazy to think how much technology is available, and yet we're, we as an industry are not yet taking it as much advantage of it as we could. Ryan Scott, it was a great discussion here and certainly a great couple of days of discussion. appreciate your viewpoints. Um, certainly we're in changing and exciting times. Thanks for joining us today on the podcast. Thank you. Happy to do it. Thanks for the time. If you have a topic that you'd like us to discuss on the Hospital Finance Podcast, or if you'd like to be a guest, drop us a line at update at Bessler.com. This concludes today's episode of the Hospital Finance Podcast. For show notes and additional resources to help you protect and enhance revenue at your hospital, visit Bessler.com forward slash podcasts. The Hospital Finance Podcast is a production of Bessler. Smart about revenue, tenacious about results.